Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, last week, some of the pastors and elders of our church and I were in Denver, Colorado for the annual assembly of our denomination. Uh, our church is part of a family of churches, part of an association, part of a denomination called the Evangelical Presbyterian Church, or the EPC. And uh, we get together once a year, the leaders of these 600 churches in the country, for worship and prayer and learning and, uh, and business. And it really was uh, very inspiring. Uh, we talked about global missions and about church planting and about growing ethnic diversity. Oh, thank you. Here comes my, my prop. Thank you, Weston. It's really hard to move. Uh, well, you couldn't see that in the sanctuary, but Weston was having a little trouble moving this, uh, moving this thing this morning. Um, I, I always leave from these uh, denominational events actually pretty inspired. I know in our day, people think of, of church denominations as being old school or bureaucratic or hierarchical, and they can be if you're not careful, but I left the assembly this year again uh, seeing the value of connectionalism, mutual submission, and accountability. And I wish I had more time to tell you about that this morning, but we have a big topic today. Last Sunday, we started a a two-week series on the topic of heaven, and I made some big promises last week about questions that would be resolved uh, today. Uh, Most of what we think we know about heaven does not come from the Bible. Most of what we think we know about heaven comes from Renaissance arts, comes from movies, comes from cartoons, you know, images of people on clouds and, and harps. And uh, even those of us that want to, uh, to have a biblically informed image of heaven, uh, that can be difficult too because the Bible uses lots of metaphors in this category. And uh, as I said last week, uh, we read a lot in the Bible about what happens in end times after Jesus returns. And, uh, we, and we read about heaven and, and we've kind of put all that together and, and they're actually not the same thing. And I'm going to try to separate those this morning. Uh, You're going to hear me say some things this morning that you're going to want to fact check. And I want you to know that I encourage that. In fact, if I say something today that makes you pick up a book on the topic or to Google search some questions or even better, uh, pick up your Bible and read what the Bible says about it, if if, uh, this motivates you to do those things, I will consider this a really effective uh, day. Uh, A guy said to his elderly uncle, Um, you're really getting up there in age, you should spend some time thinking about the hereafter. And the uncle said, oh, I do all the time. Every time I walk into a room, I stop and I have to think, what am I hereafter? And and today we're going to be talking about the hereafter. And to organize our thoughts today, I'm going to talk about seven myths about heaven, seven things you think the Bible says that it doesn't actually say. And this really probably is more of a teaching than it is a sermon, but the first myth is this. The Bible uses the word heaven to describe the place we go after we die. Okay, heaven in the Bible, uh, Shemayim in Hebrew, is used in at least a few different ways. And uh, in, in in Hebrew, like in English, it's used a couple different ways. It can be used uh, to refer to the, uh, the sky, you know, or the atmosphere. You know, we, we say, man, uh, last week the heavens opened and the rain came down. We're talking about the atmosphere. It can be used to talk about, uh, you know, the stars, you know, or, or outer space. Uh, we say, man, the heavens look beautiful tonight. We're talking about the, the stars. Or, or it can be used to refer to uh, God's dwelling place. God's dwelling Right, we say, our Father who is in heaven. These are all uses of the Hebrew word and the English word in ordinary language. So we're going to play now the name that heaven game. And here's the way it's going to work. I'm going to read to you a verse of the Bible that has the word heaven in it. And your job is to tell me which use of the word heaven uh, the Bible is employing at that particular part. Okay? And you know how these games are, uh, go? It starts out super, super easy, and it gets progressively more difficult. And that's the way we're going to play this. And the first verse is this from Deuteronomy 1.10. You are today as numerous as the stars of heaven. Stars, space. Number two, yes. 
All right, let's try uh, Psalm 11.4. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. God's dwelling, number three. Genesis 1.20, and God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of heaven. Where, where do the birds fly? Number one, oh, you're good at this. Um, let's jump right to the challenge round. Uh, those of you that are doing slides, we're going to the challenge round. Psalm uh, 19.1. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Oh, I hear a little uh, debate there. Which heavens proclaim the glory of God? You could argue all the heavens proclaim the glory of God. I think maybe the author is intending uh, number two. How about this one, Ezekiel 1.1? 1, 1. The heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. Okay, I've heard all three being voted on. That's been right. You, you, maybe maybe all the heavens have to be opened to see God. I don't know how that works, but if we have to pick one, maybe it's number three, God's dwelling. Um, how about this one, Genesis one one? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Sanctuary. Oh, that was that was weird. Uh, which heavens did God create? God created all of them. Uh, we can't be certain which heavens are here, other, though the sky is mentioned later in creation account and the moon is created later. Uh, but a lot of scholars think this is sort of a preamble to the creation account. The people thought in terms of heavens and earth being the created order, and uh, that's probably what's implied here. And maybe it doesn't matter. God created it all. Heaven, for the most part, is the place where God dwells and Jesus came and said the kingdom of heaven has come near God's dwelling it turns out is not so far away this was much of the good news that Jesus taught interestingly the word heaven is never used in the Bible as the place you go when you die although I think it's fair to use the term in this way when you die you go to be with God with Jesus and where is God and where is Jesus? They're in heaven. So I think it's uh, fair to use it that term. The, the, the word that Jesus uses is paradise. He says to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. And then later Jesus uses the term Adam, uh, uh, Abraham's bosom. Remember this? Uh, there's a vision of a guy who comes to Abraham's bosom, Abraham's arms, Abraham's side. And people have wondered, is paradise and Abraham's bosom and heaven all referring to the same thing. I think so. Other people have more complicated ideas. But interestingly, the word heaven used for lots of different things in the Bible is never used explicitly as the name of the place people go after they die. Myth number two, we should not think about heaven. That's a myth. Some people say heaven's too confusing. We can't know really anything about heaven anyway. And why even think about it? Just trust God. And thinking about heaven would just be a waste of uh, imagination. Some have even cited this Bible passage from 1 Corinthians. Uh, However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. The future is going to be great, so why even think about it? We can't know anything anyway. Is that what this passage says? I don't think we read far enough. What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. And then we miss the last line. These are the things God has revealed to us by his Spirit. God has revealed to us by his Spirit and in his word, glimpses of heaven. Why has God done that? I think to fire up our imagination, to, to kindle in us a love for heaven, to give us a future hope. We can and should think about it. Randy Elkhorn has an excellent book called, uh, the book is about heaven, and it's in our library, and the title of the book is Heaven which I would have thought was a title that had already been taken. But Randy Elkhorn apparently has copyright on heaven. And Randy Elkhorn says that thinking about heaven is a healthy use of imagination. 
He writes in his book, as long as the resurrected universe remains either undesirable or unimaginable, Satan succeeds in sabotaging our love for heaven. It's okay to imagine heaven. The people in the Bible did so. In Hebrews chapter 11, it's talking about all these great people of faith. And when it talks about Abraham, it says this in verse 10, for Abraham was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. Another metaphor for heaven. Abraham was looking forward to heaven. It says all these people of faith in this great chapter uh, admitted they were aliens and strangers on this earth and they, uh, verse 14, people who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. It's another reference to heaven and Second Peter says, but in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward, there it is again, to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. I think the concern about people thinking about heaven and I've heard this phrase used about somebody. They say, she's so heavenly minded, she's no earthly good. Have you ever heard that phrase? She's so heavenly minded, she's no earthly good. The, the concern is if somebody thinks too much about heaven, then they're not engaged here on earth. And I think that, that could be a fair warning. But personally, I have never met anybody who thinks too much about heaven. I just haven't. I think we need to think about heaven more. C.S. Lewis wrote in Mere Christianity, he said, looking forward to the eternal world is not, as some suppose, a form of escapism or wishful thinking. It is one of the things a Christian is meant to do. It does not mean that we are to leave this present world as it is. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were just those who thought the most about the next. Aim for heaven and you get earth thrown in. The next myth. There is no awareness of earth in heaven. People in heaven have no awareness of what's going on in earth. I think this is a myth. Again, there is much that we do not know, but some scriptures would suggest there is knowledge. When Jesus was transfigured, you may remember that story from the Gospels, Jesus transfigured, and Moses and Elijah are there. Moses and Elijah had died hundreds of years earlier, but in this story, there they are with Jesus on the mountain, and they are aware of what's happening, what's going on. Jesus told a parable about lost things being found, and he said in Luke 15, 7, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Now it's a parable, but it suggests that in heaven, that heaven is aware and even rejoices when someone on earth comes into a relationship with God. Revelation talks about these saints who, who uh, were killed because of their faith. The, the, the martyrs, there's a scene where the martyrs are in heaven in Revelation, and it says this in uh, Revelation 6.10, they, the, these martyrs, called out in a loud, loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Notice that they are aware of what's going on on the earth. They are seeking. They are asking questions. Uh, notice there's a sense of time in heaven. They ask, How long, O Lord? And Lord says, You must wait a, a little longer. It's interesting that those who were martyred are identified and they are all together. So there's continuity in heaven. Sometimes people wonder, will anybody be able to recognize me in heaven? And yes, I think somehow our identity is retained. At least it is in this passage. People in heaven are not God. They are not all-knowing. Last week I wondered uh, with you, would anybody need to be taught in heaven? Or in heaven, does everybody know everything? In heaven, people do not know everything. They're not omniscient, but they do seem aware of God's plan. The next myth, this is a big one. Christians will live in heaven forever. This is a myth if by heaven you mean that time that we are separated from our bodies before Jesus Christ returns. Although it's become popular to speak about going to heaven after we die, 
The Bible promises instead the resurrection of the body and the renewal of creation, something uh, we call cosmic redemption. And it looks something like this, if I can sketch out the uh, plan of the Bible. Just talk, talk amongst yourselves for a minute. <laughs> All right, in the beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth, and we read about this place in creation the Garden of Eden. And the garden is a fantastic place for humanity. There's a oneness with God. There's a oneness with each other. There is no shame, no sin, no death. And in, in the opening page of the Bible, there's this tree and there's this river and it is flourishing with life and it's beautiful. Now we know that doesn't last very long. Sin enters the world and the world gets in trouble. But throughout all the Bible, they look forward to this day where everything will be restored. And both Old and New Testaments call it the new heaven and earth. And the Old Testament prophets read a lot about this. One day, the lion will lie down with the lamb. One day, sword will be beaten into plowshares. There'll be no war, no crying, no death. Uh, God will dwell fully with his people once more, just like he did in the garden. And interestingly, in the image in the garden and here, there is a tree and there's a river, and there are very similar scenes, and God dwells with his people, and God dwells fully with his people, and all wrongs will be set right, and this is going to be a beautiful day, and all of creation, we can, we, can, we can get pessimistic that things are going bad in our world, but actually things are moving toward a great conclusion, a new heaven and a new earth, and this gave people great hope. Now, we know in the New Testament, this will not happen until Jesus Christ returns again. He will usher in this new heaven and this new earth. So what happens in between? Well, it does seem that right now we think of heaven as one category and earth as another. God's dwelling place is heaven. Our dwelling place is earth. And when Jesus Christ came for the first time, he announced the kingdom of heaven is near. God's dwelling is available to you now. Jesus talked a lot more about heaven coming down to earth than he talked about us going up to heaven. And so in Jesus, with this time, heaven and earth become a little bit blurry. They're overlapping. You can access heaven now. You can be part of heaven now. Heaven and earth kind of come together, but ultimately, uh, eventually, they will come together in fullness. Heaven and earth will meet together in a new heaven and a new earth. So what happens when you die? Paul does say that his soul uh, separated from his body and goes to heaven to be with God, but that ultimately heaven and earth will join together. I've heard people call this future heaven and this heaven. The Bible does not use that language, but I think that's a helpful way to explain it so that ultimately your, your, our destiny is the new heaven and the new earth. Look what it says in Revelation chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea, which was a, a metaphor for separation. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a beautiful a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and, and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eye. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Next myth is related. We will spend eternity without a body. Most people assume that we will spend eternity as disembodied spirits in a non-physical realm somewhere other than planet Earth. But the early Christians, like the Jews before them, looked forward to the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. They looked forward to peace on Earth. Paul did say that his body, his soul would be separated from his body, uh, but theologians call that the intermediate state. Between the time that we die and the time that Jesus returns, theologians call the intermediate state. It's a temporary state. 
when Jesus appears in the end, he will, says Philippians 3, uh, verse 21, he will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Don't know exactly what that means, but Jesus rose bodily from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus was not metaphorical. It wasn't just spiritual resurrection. He was bodily, physically resurrected. And the Jewish people and the first converts to Christianity believed that God would resurrect them too. Now, did they get pushback for this teaching? Of course they did. People in that day and in ours know that dead things tend to stay dead. But Paul said, if you believe that God bodily rose Jesus from the dead, why can't you believe that God will bodily raise you from the dead as well? Now, people from a Jewish background did not have a lot of problems with that. They had long believed and anticipated a future resurrection. But people had lots of questions with this. You do too. How does that happen? What kind of body are we going to have? And Paul addresses this, 1 Corinthians 15. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? What kind of body uh, will they uh, come? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish. So, so much for no questions, a bad question. <laughs> what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives his own body. So after Jesus returns, after the resurrection of the dead, uh, we will have a body of some kind. It won't be exactly like the one we have now, but maybe the one we have now is kind of like a seed for the body that we will have someday. I don't know how that's all going to work. Paul went on to talk about this. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. Right? We're not all going to die. Maybe some people might be alive when Jesus comes. We're not all going to sleep. But we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying will come true, death has been swallowed up in victory. The dead will be raised and changed and will somehow become imperishable. Uh, this teaching is either going to be the most clarifying or confusing thing you have ever heard in your lifetime. Uh, the next myth is that the earth will be destroyed in the judgment when Jesus returns. A lot of people think Jesus comes, takes us all to heaven, and the earth is destroyed. But that's not actually uh, what the Bible says. Throughout the whole Bible, including the Old Testament prophets, there's this sense that God is not going to abandon the creation that he made and called good. In fact, there's a lot of evidence that he is restoring and renewing uh, his good creation. Now, it's going to be different. God will renovate the entire created order. Uh, he will purge it of everything futile and evil and painful, uh, but that it is being renewed. We read Paul's words in Romans chapter 8, For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay, and brought into the freedom and glory of the children, and, uh, children of God. Creation itself is frustrated. It's in bondage. It longs to be set free. And one day it will be. For God so loved the world, the, the cosmos. God loved the created order that God sent his son, Jesus, so that all creation will be set free from the curse and will finally be restored. Now, a lot of confusion about this, and for good reason. The verse we read earlier said that the, uh, the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there's a new heaven and a new earth. But as we look at the original Greek language, they had different words for the word new. Uh, if something's brand new, uh, the word is neo. If you build a brand new house, it is neo. But then your house becomes old, archaeos. 
And if you remodel your house, it's not Neo again. It can't be Neo, Neo again. Neo is, is, is new chronologically. It would be, uh, the, they have another word for that. And the word uh, Neo was not used in this passage. The word used is kainos, kainos, which means qualitatively new or renewed. And interestingly enough, this word kainos is the word Paul used when he said that you are a new creation. You're not neo-new. You only get one shot at that when you're first born. You're not neo-new. In fact, some of you are our chaos. <laughs> but in Jesus Christ, you are made kainos new. The, the old, the archaeos, has passed away, and, you, and, and the kainos, the new, has come. You are made qualitatively new. You are redeemed and renewed, and therefore the passage is not alluding to a heaven and earth that are destroyed and replaced by a brand new heaven and earth. They're both speaking of a current heaven and a current earth passing from one condition to another, qualitatively renewed to their full glory, which is beyond anything we can comprehend. The final destination of God's people is not going up there to heaven somewhere while the earth and the sky are destroyed. Rather, the final destination is a renewed world in which God comes down and dwells among his people. And if that doesn't get you hopeful about the future, nothing else will. Apparently, when Jesus said he's making everything new, he really meant everything. And the last myth we'll talk about today is that heaven is all about the future. I think we've already covered this, but this is a good one to go home on. Heaven is not merely what happens in the future when you die. And it's not merely what happens in the future when Jesus returns. Uh, heaven is now. The kingdom of heaven is available now. Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. This, this is not about the future. God has blessed you in the heavenly realms right now. He said this again in Ephesians 2, 6. And God raised us up with Christ and has seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. This is not about the future. God has seated us now with him in the heavenly realms. In fact, realm is a helpful way maybe to think about heaven, not a place geographically distant, but a whole nother uh, uh, realm. A whole, uh, you science fiction people are way ahead of us. Uh, there's a whole other realm that exists that's available. Paul said our citizenship is in heaven. Not someday. He's writing to a colony. Philippi was a colony of the Roman Empire. Lots of military veterans lived in Philippi. They were citizens of Rome, but they didn't live in Rome. And they didn't have to go to Rome to become a citizen. They are citizens of Rome. Paul is not telling his readers that you've got to die and go to heaven to become a citizen of heaven. He's saying you are a citizen of heaven right now, where you are. The kingdom of heaven is available now. God's presence is with you now. We can work in God's kingdom for God's kingdom now. And we can pray, Father, your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we can anticipate with joy that time when God's kingdom will come in fullness. We can experience God's kingdom now in part, but one day it will come in fullness when God will set all things right, when God will reign over a renewed heaven and a renewed earth. And we can trust that even death will not separate us from God's love and God's presence. Are you with me? Would you stand to your feet and let's pray. Our Father who is in heaven, our Father who is here, thank you that nothing, not even death, can separate us from your love. There is much that we do not understand. Your word says no human mind has conceived the things God has prepared for those who love him. We do not know the future, but we know the one who holds the future. We trust you and in your unfailing goodness. Thank you for setting eternity in our hearts and for giving us a glimpse of things to come. We are yours forevermore. This we pray in Jesus' name. 
And the whole church said, 